It is the second Sunday of Easter, and if you didn't already know that from looking at a calendar, you probably guessed it because one of our favorite family members has come for his annual visit. No, not John the Baptist, that's Advent. It's crazy old Uncle Thomas. Thomas, whom some in the family call Didymus, which means twin, though no one in the family knows why, considering we never heard of or met his sister or brother. Thomas, the uncle we always talk about because he was, according to some in the family, a doubter. Thomas comes to town to clean up the leftover jelly beans, eat some egg salad, and gobble up the last ham sandwich. Still, Uncle Thomas' annual stopover allows us to consider a few delightful questions. Chief among them, what is proof and how much should you trust it? We are, in all honesty, a proof-seeking people. We want to know everything about everything. We like having data. We like information. We get, we're getting pretty adept at the Google. We like Carfax when buying a car. We consult consumer reports before buying a dishwasher. We even expect McDonald's to have nutritional information about the fat and calorie content of our Big Mac and fries, though I doubt that we ever really read it because if we did, we would run screaming from the counter. <laughs> information, support, data, facts, figures, that's what we value. Those are the things on which we depend, and just so that we are never without them, we invent devices that enable us to take that information with us wherever we go. Thomas simply wanted what we want. He wanted information. He wanted data. He wanted something to validate what his friends were telling them. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark, and unless I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas simply wanted what the other disciples had already received. Thomas was not with the others when he appeared on Easter evening. We don't know where he was. We are not told, but the lesson is clear. Don't go blaming me when you miss church and something great happens. <laughs> go back and read the story of John's story of that first Easter. Mary Magdalene is the first one to travel to the tomb, finds the stone removed from the doorway, and runs to find Peter and presumably John. <clears throat> they run to the tomb, enter and find the body of Jesus not there, and then went home dazed and confused. Mary stays near the tomb and has an encounter with a man that she assumes to be the gardener who is, in fact, the resurrected Jesus. She goes and tells the others, I have seen the Lord. That very night, the disciples were hiding in fear, considering what the religious leaders had done to Jesus. They thought they might also come after them. <clears throat> but then suddenly, Jesus is there within the locked and barricaded room. He is present and he shows them his hands and his side and then Jesus breathes on them and tells them to receive the Holy Spirit. And Thomas missed it all. He wasn't there. So in all truth, Thomas wasn't doubting. He simply wanted the assurance that others had already received. But Thomas did have a problem. And in some ways, that problem was worse than doubt. By not believing in what the other disciples told him, Thomas is guilty of breaking trust with his fellow disciples. He no longer believes what the community of disciples believes. He rejects the witness of his friends. He spurns their stories. He refuses to believe what they told him. Thomas essentially says, there's no way I will believe unless I see it myself. Take it another way, Thomas says to his friends, your eyes and your fingers aren't enough for me. I have to do it myself. Thomas shatters the community of faith. Thomas's suspicion and mistrust 
fracture that small group, Thomas's skepticism and weariness of his fellow believers is poisonous and destructive. And it is that community-shattering behavior that the Gospel of John rejects. The reason we see Thomas in a less than favorable light is because he mistrusts and doubts. Not Jesus. He mistrusts his friends and his fellow believers. That kind of mistrust, suspicion, and caginess is at work in churches today and renders those churches ineffective. You hear of it again and again whenever the subject of church conflicts arise. Some say that they just can't trust so-and-so to do such-and-such because, and then the story is told with such embellishment that you wouldn't make that person a member of Hell's Volunteer Fire Department. Disparaging remarks are made by a disgruntled member of the church about something they think is wrong with the church and they blame it on one person or another. There are cynical members who doubt that the church will ever return to its former glory or they meet or meet the challenges before it or they refuse to accept anything new. And that is to say nothing of entire denominations and traditions that practice a divisive mistrust of anyone outside their denomination or tradition. You've heard it. If you don't believe what I believe about baptism, you're not really a Christian. If you don't believe what we believe about the Lord's Supper, you can't have any. If you have women in your church leadership, you are a congregation of Satan. On and on it goes. And I've heard lots of those kinds of divisive and destructive statements over my 30 years of ministry. And then there are those who distrust and dismiss those who are not just like them. They continue in their distrust and suspicions of those in the church of a different race or a different educational level or a different economic status or a different political party. They are wary and cautious of those who have a different orientation and who love differently than they themselves love. If you want to know why the Christian church is held in such low regard by so many, begin your search right there. Too many churches allow the insidious rot of mistrust and misgiving to infect denominations and congregations with the result that the world sees us as no better than any of the other broken and meaningless vestiges of the past. Now here's the thing. When you read the Gospel of John, and when you read the letters of John that grew out of that tradition, You cannot miss that love and trust within the faithful community of God's people is understood as an expression of the risen Christ in their midst. If mistrust and suspicion rules the roost, then the risen Christ is noticeably absent. And there is the reminder Being faithful to the risen Christ means trusting and relying on our fellow believers. Whatever we are doing to fracture the body of Christ is a direct reflection of our lack of confidence and trust in our fellow Christians. As Nancy Claire Pittman writes, at the very least, we must stop questioning motives, doubting direction, and dedication, and thinking the worst of our companions when they state a different opinion or a contradictory version. We must learn not to only to believe in the simple goodness of the Lord, but in the goodness of one another. It's interesting. Those who believe without seeing are called blessed, and we are celebrated. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have come to believe. There are plenty of problems with proof 
and the need for physical proof of spiritual things. Those who seek such proof will be disappointed ever and always when it comes to spiritual things. Those who seek physical evidence will usually come up wanting. Those who look for total confirmation will be frustrated. There is no blessing in accumulating data and facts and figures about the risen Christ. Statistical studies, Google searches, archaeological digs, and all the rest will never prove it all. So what does that mean? You'll just have to trust me when I tell you Christ is risen. And that means I'm going to have to trust you when you tell me Christ is risen. And we'll go on trusting each other and following where the risen Lord leads us. For now and evermore. Amen.